on, an, on another topic when you get a chance, please. I got it. Uh, you can call me this afternoon or I got a text I'm sending out today, so. Thanks. Okay, we'll go in just a minute here. Okay, we will go ahead and get going. Welcome everybody to our weekly news conference discussing all things regarding the COVID-19 pandemic response in the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, IU Health and Indiana University. Uh, I am Chuck Carney, Director of Media Relations for Indiana University, and I will introduce everybody as we go along. We will start off with the mayor of uh, Bloomington, John Hamilton. Thanks so much and good afternoon, everybody. I uh, appreciate uh, the time here. I, I want to note, uh, I start by noting that three employees for the city have been diagnosed with COVID in the last two weeks. Uh, we, our thoughts go to them. They all seem to be recovering, but a reminder that this virus is all around us. Of course, uh, you'll hear, I know, continued good local news overall in terms of our uh, performance, if you will, uh, that we, we do see of course, the virus is here, but what we are doing locally really is making a difference, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank everyone for that, and you'll hear more details about that while uh, noting a couple really important points from my perspective. First, um, while we are doing better, an island in a sea of troubles is not in a safe spot. Uh, with rising waters all around us, pandemic rates dramatically increasing, that is a real threat to us, even when we try to do everything right. Uh, and in particular, I just, I just want to emphasize the state is going through a very dramatic rise uh, in incidence of this disease. Um, in, in August and September, the state of Indiana saw eight or 900 cases uh, a day. Uh, as a seven day average, it was between eight and 900 into the 900s during August and September. In October, it has nearly tripled to more than 2,400 cases on a seven day moving average. That is a dramatic spike across the state, uh, a, a virtual tripling of daily cases uh, that we're seeing around the state. Uh, and deaths too have more than doubled uh, on a seven day daily average. Uh, that means this state is going significantly in the wrong direction. That coupled with the national news uh, today, I, I heard reported that there is not a single state in the United States that is moving in the right direction with reducing cases. Every state is increasing. Indiana has more than doubled, uh, nearly tripled our, our case rate. And while we are doing pretty well uh, relative to that in Monroe County, it is really not easy to maintain that in the midst of that rise of the cases around us. Um, Second point is just that as indoor activity increases, as holidays and travel increase, uh, the kind of gatherings and, and social interactions that seem to be how this spread happens are more likely. Uh, that means the combination of that really dramatic rise around us uh, and the fact that uh, with indoors uh, and potential holiday and travel time over the next couple months coming at us, it's really uh, an important time not to let pandemic fatigue uh, get us, uh, but to continue on what we're doing. Uh, it, it, is, it is critically important. Uh, we are not where we ought to be. Dr. Fauci said we're going the wrong direction uh, as a country. So please uh, stay to what you're doing. Thank you locally for all the great work, masking, physical distancing, hygiene, staying at home, we're really doing many of the right things and those will make the difference. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we continue to watch uh, things like football celebrations and 
We're going to continue to work to, to manage uh, those potential events. But overall, this emphasis on wrong direction around us means we have to pay particular attention and, and winter, indoor, and, and holiday gatherings uh, just remind us how important it is to keep, keep doing what we're doing. So um, I'll be happy to answer more specific questions and hand it back to you. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, well, let's get a, a look at what's happening in the county. Let's go to Penny Caudle, who's the Monroe County Health Department Administrator. Good afternoon, and I will echo much of what the mayor just, just said, and prevention is key. We do have the tools to reduce the spread of this virus, and we can do it if we continue to work together. So continue maintaining those six foot distances so that we put distance between us so we don't become a close contact. And I would say, let's not make ourselves close contacts and let's not make other people around us a close contact. And the one way that we can do that is by maintaining at least that six foot distance. We can also prevent the spread of this infection by making sure that we are wearing our masks. And uh, that's especially important for those short bouts of time when we may not be able to maintain that six foot distance. And when we're around uh, other people, we may not know, uh, but we need to remember that even people we know and our family members can be infected. And so when we were, are clo close with them and proximity, we need to make sure that we are masking. Uh, we need to, again, avoid crowds. And I've, we've talked about this before. Crowds sounds like it's a crowd of, you know, hundreds or thousands of people. And yes, those are worrisome. But, you know, that crowd that is crowded together um, whether even if it's five people, if you are not maintaining that social distance, it's a crowded area, uh, not masking. Those things put you at risk. Also, staying home if you are ill, if you think that you might be infected and you're waiting on test results, stay at home until you get them and you get the all clear. Uh, and also hand hygiene, hand washing, um, hand sanitizer if you don't have soap and water available. Those are all things we've talked about for a long time, uh, but they are the keys to prevention. And as we're into flu season, get your flu vaccine now. Um, we are making plans for COVID vaccine when that becomes available, and we will encourage you to do that when that's available. Um, in terms of flu clinics, uh, there is a flu shot clinic on November 3rd at the Redeemer Church um, and the hospital and our nurses, you know, there's lots of planning. The hospital has been wonderful in supplying our community with lots of flu vaccine and we wanna say thank you for that IU Health. Um, as we talk about the numbers, uh, you know, the mayor's right. We seem, if you kind of look at some of the numbers, we look like a little island, but we know that we are not an island alone, that we work and we play and we do things in, across county lines. Uh, people travel, people still travel, even in this pandemic. And so we can't assume that we aren't going to um, spread the virus to other communities or that it's not going to increase in our community. This week, we have seen some daily increase in positive cases um, in numbers higher than we have seen. You know, we've seen uh, 50, uh, 60 cases a day. Now, those days, we have also had large number of tests done. So while the positivity rate may look smaller, those are still cases that indicate the virus is circulating in our community at a level that we really don't want it to be circulating at. When we look at our cases per 100,000, they are higher than we want them to be. Uh, they're over 100 and we want them like under 10 is what we really want. Uh, but right now I will settle in the short term. My short term goal is let's get them under 100 cases um, per 100,000. Um, and then we'll talk about getting them even, even lower. So I have a little challenge for you, I guess, is let's mask up, let's um, you know, keep that six foot distance um, and do everything that we can to reduce the transmission of this infection. 
as we come into the holidays and the, and the weekend and, and those kinds of things, I do want to share a couple things just about Halloween. Uh, this weekend, we've talked about that. There are some safer ways to celebrate Halloween. Uh, traditional <laughs> trick-or-treating is not among them. Uh, so think about how you can do that. We would ask on, that you share your creativity on our Facebook page and let us know how you are safely celebrating Halloween this year. Uh, one thing came across my desk and I thought, wow, what a, what a truly creative idea. We know that haunted houses uh, that traditional haunted house is a high risk activity, um, but someone sent me a picture of a haunted car wash and they had taken their car wash and they had decorated it and, and made it a ha haunted car wash. And I thought, what a creative idea. I, I've been saying that I know people have <laughs> lots of creative juices flowing and there are lots of fun things <laughs> you can do. Um, and so I guess that's a good way to build your business as well as, um, Make, make some fun out of getting that car washed. So again, celebrate Halloween, uh, just do it safely. We don't want to see a spike in cases because we did things in an unsafe manner and we, and we don't have to have that happen. In terms of businesses, I would just say, you know, we have businesses who are trying very hard to follow the regulations and we need them to continue to do that. And they need their patrons to also be respectful and follow those regulations as well. It is by acting together uh, and supporting one another that we will all keep our businesses open and keep transmission of this infection down as well. Um, I did have a friend share a story with me this morning. And I have to tell you, when I first got the text, I thought, oh, no, they're going to tell me something bad some business did. But it actually was a very good story. And I won't, I won't share the name of the business, but this friend was in a business waiting on service. And they had their signage and masks, and the business was wearing their masks. And someone came in without one. And was pretty vocal that they didn't want to wear one. And um, the employee said, here's a mask. We have some for you. We need you to wear this. And the person still didn't want to take it. And they said, if you want service here today, we need you to wear this mask. And they did. Um, so again, it is difficult for businesses sometimes to make that ask. Um, they don't want to confront people who aren't wearing them, but most of the businesses have them available if you forgot yours. So we just want to work together and I want to give a shout out to those businesses who are making that ask. Um, that is one of the most common complaints we get is that uh, businesses are not enforcing um, mask wearing. And most of the time, you know, they're asking, uh, we do have some exceptions, so it can make it difficult um, just going to maybe and seeing someone a mask doesn't mean that they weren't asked to. And we do follow up on complaints that we get. But I wanted to give a positive shout out to a business um, today. And I guess the last thing that I would say again is we have the tools. Uh, please use them. We don't have to see increases of this infection spread. And as the mayor's already said, we know that as a state and a nation, things are not going in the right direction, but we can, we have tools to control this. We can move it back in a positive, a good direction. So let's do that. Back to you, Chuck. Okay, let's go to Monroe County Commissioner's President, Julie Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate this weekly opportunity to reach out to everyone, uh, let them know what's going on. So just a couple quick updates. Um, some of these will sound familiar, I apologize, but uh, we are providing uh, CARES funding and grants for local businesses. Um, and so any, any business in the community that has excessive COVID costs that have not been covered by a previous loan or grant um, are invited to visit co.monroe.in.us. Uh, so far, as of yesterday, we have um, allocated um, almost $190,000 to local businesses and um, $46,600 to other taxing units that needed some additional funding. Um, 
So this is non-payroll expenses, but we did increase the cap uh, to 20,000 per business. So please go ahead and sign up um, if you need assistance. Um, also a note about uh, voting hours. We know the lines have been long. Uh, the election board um, makes those determinations about hours and locations. Um, and uh, but they did extend the hours. So if I if I may just read through quickly what we have left for early voting in person absentee ballot hours uh, today until 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, November 2nd uh, 8 a.m. to noon and that's Monday uh, and that's at Election Central 401 West 7th. Of course election day is on Tuesday and there you will need to vote at your precinct polling place. Uh, for more information go to indianavoters.com uh, or monroecountyvoters.us. Uh, uh, for that information. Uh, we're also providing assistance uh, with uh, the commissioners and the council are providing assistance to township governments to ensure that uh, people are able to maintain their shelter and their utilities. Um, so we're trying to avoid um, uh, evictions and disconnections. And we are at uh, $39,000 in direct aid to county residents. Uh, every county resident has a township. Um, uh, is in a township and should contact their uh, township trustee for information if they're in danger of um, eviction or disconnections. Uh, we do have Halloween hours set for the county, 6 to 8 p.m. tomorrow. Um, there is a great list of information on our website, co.monroe.in.us. And that information is uh, about safe practices, things to be thinking about uh, in order to maintain um, a safe uh, Halloween celebration, but also there's a list of fire stations uh, throughout the community that are participating in a safe Halloween celebration as well. Um, another note from our treasurer, uh, tax bills are due on November 10th, um, and but we are keeping our buildings closed except by appointment. So if you do need assistance, um, you should call the treasurer's office 349-2530 to make an appointment if you need to stop in the office. We do have a physical drop box on the north side of the courthouse door. And we also have options available for residents, including uh, e-check, credit card, uh, or you can mail, snail mail your payment in. Uh, but if you have questions about anything relating to this, please contact your uh, Monroe County Treasurer uh, Jessica McClellan and her great staff. They will help you out. You can go to co.monroe.in.us. Um, and I just want to take a moment again to thank everybody who's doing a great job and trying to protect our community. Um, just ask you to think, rethink any plans you have for travel. Uh, is it really necessary? Um, but please take a moment and celebrate and honor your resiliency to this point. Um, and kind of shore up your commitment uh, to get through the next several months of winter, which is going to be a bit different. Uh, so thank you all, and I'll wait for questions. Okay. Uh, next, sitting in on today's call will be Kate Petroline, who's Deputy Director of the Monroe County Emergency Management. Thank you, Chuck. Good afternoon, everyone. I just have a couple of updates from our office. First and foremost, I wanna thank everyone who participated in the October blood drives. They were both a success. Going off that note, October was the first month that we offered evening slots and it was such a success. Monroe County government in partnership with the Red Cross and the Monroe Convention Center has decided to offer one drive a month that will be in the evening and we can foresee that through March of 2021. Sounds crazy to say 2021, but it's coming soon. But for November, the evening date would be November 19th from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then the day date is actually a few days earlier on November 9th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can reserve a slot by going onto redcross.org's website and you can click on a time and a date of which you would like to give blood or you can find more details on our website at co.monroe.in.us. 
Second and finally, I'm just going to echo what Commissioner Thomas spoke about with the trick-or-treating. We do have various fire departments that have graciously uh, opened up their doors for tomorrow from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. They will be following CDC guidelines to hand out candies to your kiddos. So please stop by and grab some candy and happy Halloween. Thank you. Okay. Let's next go to IU Health and Brian Shockney. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this week, South Central Region has hit its highest number of uh, inpatients since the pandemic began. Um, and so we, again, continue to thank you for your diligence, but ask that you uh, consider what you're doing this weekend and then the days ahead regarding mask wearing and all the things that you're doing. We are on 24-7, 365 incident command, not only at the system level, but also at the regional level. Here in Monroe County, both IU Health, Bloomington, and Monroe hospitals have seen an increase, so the trend is very similar to what we're seeing across the region. Um, and we continue to leverage the strength of the IU Health system, not only with uh, support with our PPE and patient bed staffing and all those things across the state of Indiana, as all of our hospitals in Indiana are experiencing this same increase in inpatients, and which usually and always <laughs> in this pandemic has followed the higher level of incidence and positivity in our communities. Uh, so flu vaccines, uh, was mentioned about some vaccines. We have given over 22,000 flu vaccines in our community so far in the South Central region. We will have given over 50,000 when all is said and done here in the next few weeks. And on the screen, you'll see there are several opportunities for you to get your flu vaccine. It is a great opportunity for you to protect yourself against the regular flu that we know is coming through uh, and be prepared and healthy for the winter season. With these, uh, this rise in COVID-19 hospitalizations, I just want to say something about Halloween. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, from a healthcare perspective, IU Health's one of our four goals, uh, four areas for making our vision come true for making Indiana a healthier state is to reduce the incidence of obesity. And if you go out on uh, CDC guidelines or websites and others, you'll see that the average bag of candy for a child is 4,800 calories. That's uh, three cups of sugar and a one and a half cups of fat. Um, and so uh, not that they shouldn't be eating candy and we shouldn't do all things in moderation, but just want to lay that out there for those kiddos and for those parents to be sure that uh, we're making that they, they don't eat everything that they get in their bag, select out those good things that they get uh, and, and let them eat those and the rest of them uh, celebrate uh, those going in the trash if you, <laughs> if you can. Uh, the other thing, uh, Commissioner Thomas, I thank her for her comments about taking care of yourself, especially as we go into this winter season. Uh, you know, studies have shown that taking breaks are a good thing. And it seems like we all feel like we're on a treadmill with uh, data, news, work, um, you know, our, our, our boundaries have, have moved. And so we just want you to, to think about uh, doing some things this weekend, specifically as we're ending the fall season, you know, take a, take a walk together, especially with your kids as we see, um, you know, fall breaks. And then uh, some of the schools have now announced that they are going back to home uh, based schooling, um, take a walk with your kids, you know, make it fun, look at animals, bugs, pets, um, you know, making sure that they're getting the proper sleep that they need. Um, you see the Riley logo behind me, uh, making sure that, you know, you're, you're checking in with their doctor, um, taking time to be sure that if there's something unusual about their behavior, that you're checking in with their pediatrician or their family practitioner. Some power naps. I remember my kindergarten days. I still remember those great naps we used to take on the mat and uh, those power naps for your kids in the middle of the day if they're schooling at home would be a great thing for them to do. Uh, and then just some uh, deep breathing exercises and some relaxation for them as they're home. Um, this is a big change for them when they have been at home, now they're at school, back into what they feel is a routine, and then they may come back, you know, to, to that home environment. So please keep that in mind. 
And if you do not have small ones, um, you know, look, look at your neighbors, look at those that uh, you socialize with and connect with and help those kiddos as well. Uh, you know, it's almost cliche to say that uh, we're in this together. However, uh, it's more important now than ever as we see this uh, pandemic, the second growth of this pandemic in our communities. And then last but not least, I would like to put a shout out to um, one of our heroes, Penny Cottle. It is her birthday this weekend. And uh, she, I just want to wish her a happy birthday. And thank you, Penny, for all that you do. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, next go to Kirk White, who can give us the view from Indiana University. Hey, thanks, Chuck, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to be with you this afternoon on a sunny fall afternoon in Bloomington. Let's start out with, uh, I use Dashboard. Uh, this week has really been the second best week of the semester uh, for the reporting that uh, concluded uh, just a week ago, uh, Friday, and we compiled the results uh, earlier this week. I think uh, everyone's seen the numbers, perhaps, but uh, our Greek uh, our Greek organizations uh, did tick up just a bit from 1.5 to 2.0 percent in our mitigation testing. Uh, the residence halls went uh, down from 1.1 down to 0 0.6. Uh, Greek uh, Greek students that live out went uh, down from 2.3 to 2.1 percent. And our off-campus population ticked up just a point, uh, a tenth of a point from 0.8 to 0.9. Uh, so uh, this is still a pretty good trend. Uh, like I say, there were a few ticks up um, and uh, we, we are of course mindful about that, but uh, thankful that we're able to do the level of testing that we are. Uh, next uh, is uh, uh, flu shots and uh, the campus is, uh, done very well with its flu shot uh, campaign. We have our, our uh, last large uh, clinic tomorrow at Assembly Hall. So anybody in our students, faculty and staff that have not yet gotten their, their uh, uh, flu shot can go online and make an appointment and drop in uh, tomorrow at uh, Simon Scott Assembly Hall uh, to get that taken care of. And then if uh, you don't make it tomorrow, it's not the, the end, uh, we'll still be giving flu shots during our regular mitigation testing uh, so that you can uh, get your normally scheduled mitigation test uh, for COVID and then at the same place, get a flu shot. And finally, the last option is also to get one at the Student Health Center. All these are uh, available and will continue to be, and we urge you to get that uh, taken care of because it is a requirement that all of our students, faculty and staff uh, are vaccinated for influenza this year as part of your student and employee commitment. Uh, a, a, a word about uh, last Saturday's uh, celebration after the Penn State game. Of course, we were excited for the Hoosiers, but concerned about uh, some of the, uh, the gatherings that took place in celebration or some of the game watching parties that occurred. Most, uh, most of these activities were safe, but we had a few that weren't. Uh, four of the uh, parties or large gatherings that were reported to uh, Indiana University Police violated our policies. And uh, we will uh, identify those who are responsible for organizing them and they will go through the university disciplinary process. Uh, some people have described these large events as uh, a kind of corona virus crockpot uh, where things slowly cook and then we see the results later. So we'll be watching the mitigation testing results really from yesterday, today and early next week, which would be about the five to six day average time after infection that you would start to show symptoms. And if we see upticks, we'll know exactly uh, what kind of impact uh, these uh, impromptu celebrations cause. So the, the bottom line here is to stay safe. Uh, to, uh, to celebrate, but do so in a safe manner the way we've talked, to, talked about uh, through the summer and, and through uh, the semester. And I wanna thank uh, the public support that we've received on the campus uh, throughout our efforts. Uh, you know, there's so many people that have contributed to helping us keep our numbers low in Bloomington and Monroe County as the, the mayor talked about and, and um, and President Shockney talked about earlier, 
Uh, there's a reason for that, and that's because of the great cooperation we've had by our citizens, but also by the steadfast support from the Monroe County Board of Health in the kinds of uh, proclamations and recommendations they've been able to do, as well as the mayor. So the university thanks you for that. It's allowed us to maintain campus operations as we want to continue to do through the rest of the semester and next spring as well. Finally, I want to mention the uh, the election coming up on Tuesday, because there's been a lot of concern about how COVID affects the election. People might be hesitant to vote and other things. There are lots of opportunities to do it safely. Um, we're also mindful that this is an emotional time for many, and we remember some of the uh, results uh, of folks that, that felt uh, concerned and, and had to voice their concerns after the 2016 election. And so we're committed to a safe and civil election. And I draw your attention uh, to um, Provost Rebel's uh, comments that she made in a short YouTube video. I'll put the, uh, the uh, link there in the chat. Uh, and it, it outlines some of our particular uh, uh, preparations for the election. For example, our uh, emergency operations center will be uh, staffed uh, the day before, during, and after the election to make sure that uh, that we uh, monitor the safety of uh, the campus and our polling site at the Indiana Memorial Union, as well as be ready for any kinds of other activities that might occur, again, maintaining a safe environment on the campus. And then finally, uh, we're transitioning the fall 2020 site that all of us have become accustomed to referencing. It will switch to uh, a uh, covid.iu.edu site, and I'll uh, put that link in as well for, uh, for that switch. Of course, uh, we'll still be able to, to, um, uh, to reference, uh, you'll still be able to go to the fall 2020 site and it'll direct you to this, but of course fall is gonna be over soon and uh, we'll be going to uh, the spring semester. So uh, start to bookmark this new site, which will have uh, all of the COVID information for the uh, university. And that's uh, our update for this week, Chuck, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kirk. And you uh, accurately foresaw the first question that would be coming uh, regarding the celebrations after the game. Uh, and I would add to what you said that we have already up the testing that we were doing on student. Whoops, Chuck, you went mute there for me. There you go. I don't know what happened there. Uh, so I, I was going to just add to that that we have up the testing for students uh, already. So that's one reason, one way that we'll be able to keep a handle on that as well. But uh, despite the fact that we were all happy about the immaculate conversion, uh, the agreement that students made to keep everyone safe with the policies does not change. And we will continue to watch out for that. Uh, but uh, the first question is from the B Square Beacon along those lines and expanding that out a bit. Uh, the question uh, probably most accurately uh, goes to the county and to uh, Mayor Hamilton. So to uh, what is the university, the county, the city and IU Health planning to help prevent a repeat of the situation last week when a large crowd of people not wearing masks gathered on Kirkwood Avenue to celebrate the IU football team's spectacular victory. Uh, that has been called by some an abuse of the city's efforts to help Bloomington's downtown businesses and restaurants by opening that street. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, you want to speak to that first? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, first I want to say uh, at Kirkwood, I think it's our, it appears to us that it was really not mostly people in the restaurants and establishments at Kirkwood, but rather people who are living down in and around there who uh, spontaneously uh, arrived to celebrate the, uh, the big victory. Um, we that shouldn't happen. Um, you know, we're we've been talking to Indiana University. We were talking to our uh, law enforcement and the establishments there to to uh, do what we can. I, I think you know we don't want to overreact and make a situation worse, uh, but we do uh, are talking about that at the next game of Michigan uh, next next weekend, uh, eight days from now or whatever is another uh, potential <laughs> um, upset victory, which we'll root for. Uh, but hope that the students uh, can uh, appropriate and others appropriately uh, celebrate that. And I do appreciate Indiana University, which is proceeding with disciplinary actions against those who, who take irresponsible action. But 
Um, I, I don't want to overreact to that. We will be monitoring the data closely. If we found, for example, there were really significant health uh, incidents, uh, disease incidents that's traced to that, that, that's something different. But just to remind folks, for example, the big enough is enough rally back in June, thousands of people marching outdoors. Uh, we didn't see indications of problems after that. So we hope the same will be true with this. Uh, so uh, next question, this one going to Penny Cottle. As you mentioned, the last couple of days have been have seen some spikes in Monroe County numbers after cruising along fairly steadily at around 20 to 25 cases a day. Have any positive test cases been definitively linked to the post-football victory celebration last week? They, they haven't. And as Kirk was saying earlier, you know, more likely we will, if we see those, those will be coming um, in the next few days or, or the next week. So we will certainly be watching that. What we are really seeing is family spread, uh, you know, families and close contacts. So again, it's thinking that we're safe in kind of that little bubble, um, but not, not taking into account that it's someone in that bubble, it, you know, takes, goes out and, you know, takes on another risk um, that they may bring that back into the group. So it's not that people are setting out to do that, that there's any kind of intention in doing that. It's just not kind of thinking through maybe all of our actions and what we're doing. It's about fe sometimes feeling safe in an environment that maybe isn't as safe as we think it is. And so again, we just need to do our, our part. And I think that that's true too, in terms of people who are celebrating and whatever the, the circumstance is, that if we all do our part um, and we make sure that we aren't putting ourselves in a position to be a close contact, and we're not putting someone else in a position to be a close contact to us, then we can reduce the spread of this infection. A uh, question for Mayor Hamilton and Commissioner Thomas, again from the B-Square Beacon. How bad would statewide numbers need to get before some uh, kind of travel ban into Monroe County or into the city of Bloomington would be contemplated? Could such a ban ever be enacted, uh, even be enacted where we say only essential travel into our jurisdiction is allowed? You want to go ahead, Julie? Sure. Um, you know, so it, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, this is really not a political question. It's really a health question driven by data. And we have an amazing health board and Penny Cottle, of course, and uh, Dr. Sharp. And we would we would want to hear from them um, if, if there's going to be, if, if we need to move in a different direction to increase the protection um, of our community uh, from the spread of this disease. Um, uh, one way to avoid any of that is to wear your mask. And, and again, I, I forgot to mention, but when you vote, wear your mask, and, but one will be provided for you if you need it. Um, so, um, but I will say that uh, the last part of the question is, is really an interesting one. Can it even be done? Um, what some communities did in the spring, uh, some counties did in the spring, is they um, enacted um, which a travel advisory. Um, so it's not a ban on travel. Um, and it certainly doesn't ban people from coming from outside the community into the community, but it limits uh, vehicle uh, transportation to only essential transportation. Um, it, you know, it's difficult to, um, to monitor uh, and track and um, uh, enforce that kind of thing, um, as, as well as um, it's difficult to imagine um, that that's going to be a good answer. Uh, but again, we are guided by the science, and that's how you know how we need to keep keep moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, I I just add, um, um, you know, we are a an island with rising seas of, of virus infection around us, but it is extremely difficult to put up a wall uh, like that. And we have people who work in and out, who leave uh, to go to work, who come into the county or the city to go to work. We have. Um, of course, a lot of, uh, of activity that would be stopped if we had to take that step, if we could take that step. So 
I think, um, you know, effectively be a stay at home order for us and, and a, a wall around the county would be extremely difficult and, and damaging to a lot of people, um, uh, including hospital work. I mean, you'd have to have all kinds of exceptions, of course, but um, I think more likely the focus is going to be really encouraging the state to pay more attention to this and get serious about not moving the wrong direction. Uh, recognizing a tripling in cases in a, in a month is a really desperate situation and a doubling of deaths uh, means you got to wake up and, and change what you're doing because it's it's not really tenable to have a an island of uh, dramatic difference uh, with surrounded by that kind of thing. So uh, we'll keep doing our part and we need to keep urging the state uh, and the country to, to up the game too. Question uh, uh, again from the B-Square Beacon for IU, for Kirk. As far as IU students go, one of the unfortunate mindsets goes along the lines of, if we can just make it to winter break, we'll be rid of all the students and we'll be safe from COVID-19 threat here in Monroe County. Does the kind of departure testing that's been discussed by IU officials apply to students who are simply heading back home for winter break? If not, what are we doing to make sure we're sending ho uh, students home healthy? Well, hey, that's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, we feel very, uh, very confident that we're going to be able to test, uh, offer tests to our student population that is departing uh, at the end of, of uh, fall semester. So starting on November the 15th, uh, through that week, uh, on to um, uh, Thursday of that week, I believe, uh, we will offer a departure testing for our students and uh, we'll be most likely uh, processing those through our own labs uh, here on the Bloomington campus, perhaps Indianapolis. Uh, but we'll, we will uh, we'll offer that so that uh, really for a couple of reasons, the, the, the one that you mentioned, uh, making sure that, that students are safe uh, when they do leave and go to other communities, to their families. Uh, and the other is uh, in some cases that will be a requirement. We know that uh, some municipalities and some states are, are uh, uh, that put uh, restrictions in place for people traveling from Indiana. And we're hoping that uh, the, the uh, documentation that we'll be able to provide our students about the tests that they've had just a few days before they depart or a couple of days before they depart will be enough documentation to help them avoid a quarantine situation when they're going back to their uh, home communities. So we have a plan in place to do that. Students will be able to sign up for uh, that departure testing. Again, that'll be the week of the 15th of November. And we think that uh, will be a good good thing to follow. And then the next step in all that is uh, returning uh, uh, students. So that'll be in January and February. And we're now formulating our plan for return testing uh, so that we can uh, test students as they return and get back into the population of the, uh, the campus safely. And that other point about, uh, um, you know, as, as, as soon as the students leave, we'll be safe. You know, uh, we sure shouldn't think that as a community because frankly, the, the prevalence rate, infection rate on the campus is lower than it is in uh, most of the state. Uh, we've been able, because our students have, have acted well, uh, we've been able to keep the infection rate at a, a very low level. And we're documenting it because we're, last week we tested 9,000 students and we'll keep that up. We're gonna keep increasing it. And so we, we know where, we know when infection starts, where it is, we get it in isolation or quarantine, and that's the way to control this. And we're gonna keep that in place. Um, and Kirk, one other thing to add here, I think too, that that departure testing is also open to faculty and staff who may be leaving town for the holiday. That's correct, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, you wanna make a point? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, just a couple quick points and hope the media may help spread this. First, um, it's important to recognize that Bloomington uh, and, and our county have two unusual testing uh, apparatus going on. First, IU. It's, it's really exceptional and unusual and really valuable that we have a university doing so much testing in our community of their community, which is much of our community, which gives us so much more data. Uh, as well as the city of Bloomington utilities water uh, system testing 
uh, which, which both of which give us more data than the typical place, which is really important and helpful and lets us monitor that. And by the way, the wastewater testing showed a reduction from last week when I indicated uh, we had seen a rise. We've seen a reduction come down, uh, so that's good. Um, and then the second point I just make reminding, whether you're thinking about traveling or whether you get tested negative as you're leaving or anything else, the health experts really remind us we need to think we might be infectious even the moment after that test, the hour, the day after that test. And we have to treat each other as if we might be carrying the virus. We might feel fine, they might feel fine. As Penny Cottle indicated, a lot of this transmission seems to happen with smaller gatherings, family and social gatherings. And it's, you just, even if you feel great and even if you just had a negative test, we all need to remember you still have to behave with masks and distancing in the way that will keep this virus down. And as we go indoors more, as we do some of the traveling and don't do more than you have to, we just remember a, a negative test isn't a guarantee that everything's fine at all. So um, we all need to keep doing those behaviors uh, regardless. A uh, question from Benta Boutier at uh, WFIU, WTIU uh, for Kirk. Uh, how many tests has I used Bloomington's new independent lab run this week? Um, Kirk, I, I know I was over there a couple of times this week, and it's really just sort of getting going, is it not? That's right. Uh, it is. It's going, uh, but I don't have an accurate number. Uh, I, I know a few days ago they'd done several hundred, but uh, I don't know the latest as of today. But it is up and running, and uh, uh, it'll it'll keep building capacity uh, as uh, as anything that you stand up. Uh, you want to make sure that it's it is doing exactly what it's supposed to do and be a, very accurate. So we're uh, checking to make sure all that's done. But there are no big problems at this point. And our in our Indianapolis labs, we expect to be up sometime in the next month here, uh, and we'll have three labs running tests. Uh, one quick thing, uh, Julie Thomas addressed in the chat, but this is a question from Facebook. So I want to, it's not directly COVID related, but I will work this in uh, here about expanding election uh, voting sites. Uh, and so Julie, can you address that? The question uh, being, would we consider uh, do, uh, adding more in the future? Right. So uh, thank you for that. Um, it, it is kind of COVID related because people want to get the vote in uh, early uh, and safely, of course. Uh, but yes, the uh, voting hours were expanded. I talked about that at the top of, of the, um, my, my talk. Uh, but I also want to note that the election board is the uh, decision making body. It's not something uh, that the commissioners uh, do or the council. This is a separate uh, board of three. Uh, and they make decisions about uh, voting. And it, it was not helped this year by the fact that we were in flux for quite a while, not knowing uh, whether or not uh, people could vote as they did in the spring, uh, absentee by mail for any reason, no excuse, absentee voting by mail. And that did not happen. And that, that information did not come until late. So it's just important to remember that there are a lot of things going on at the state that impact um, our ability locally to react. So the election board did a great thing and expanded the hours. Um, and if you're in line when the polls close, you are going to be able to vote. So, um, you know, you, you might want to take your chances and, and be there at, at seven o'clock um, if that works for you. So thank you for that. Yeah, Mayor Hamilton. Chuck, I'll just add and Commissioner Thomas that all, all that is correct. I just want to add that uh, the election board takes bipartisan action uh, under law to make this happen. Unfortunately, we have not had bipartisan support for a lot of really common sense steps to increase safety, to increase access to the polling. And in fact, in the opposite, we've seen uh, attempts from my perspective and as you've seen around the country to make it more difficult to vote. That is really regrettable, but it is ultimately up to the voters. So just be sure to get out there, uh, vote early if you can in person, drop your ballot off uh, or show up on election day to make sure your voice is heard. Uh, we can make sure it's safe. It's unfortunate that we don't make it easier, uh, but don't let that stop you. Uh, stay to it. Uh, one last question I'll work in here uh, for Penny Caudill. Why does the, this is from Ben Taboutier again, why does the state cover 19 uh, states COVID-19 dashboard still have Monroe County ranked as yellow, even though our seven day all test positivity rate is lower than 5%? 
That's because that metrics map uses two pieces of data. It looks at our seven day rolling average, that positivity rate, but it also looks at the number of cases per 100,000. And we are actually higher, it factors them in both. So I mentioned early on, I, I wanted that per 100,000 number to right now to be under 100. Uh, it is over 100 and so that's actually orange. And then the positivity rate would put us in blue. And so when they factor those in, we end up in yellow. So we want both of those numbers to be going down, not up. Okay. Well, that is the time we have this week. Uh, hopefully we'll have good numbers to talk about next week. Uh, happy Halloween, happy election week to everybody. And we will see you again next Friday. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Be well. Go vote.